I know I've had a few folks reach out and ask if we are going to be recording and if the recording will be available. So we will have the recording um, and um, we do need to figure out where we're gonna, if we're gonna be able to put the, the recording publicly somewhere. But um, once we have all of those details figured out, we will um, we'll let folks know somehow we'll communicate with folks um, on where it is and where folks can find it if, if we can do that. Um, so before we get started, let's just do some quick introductions. Uh, my name is Taryn Lascola Minor. I'm the Director of Crop and Pest Services within the Mass Department of Ag Resources. Um, I, um, within Crop and Pest Services, that is actually where the pesticide program is located. Um, so all things relative to pesticide fall underneath um, 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 uh, my jurisdiction. Also with me is we have uh, Michael McLean, who is the Chief Pesticide Inspector, who is um, in charge of uh, our enforcement division within the pesticide program. Uh, we also from MDAR have Jessica Bur Burgess with us, who's our legal counsel. And Colin, I'm gonna kick it over to you for a quick introduction. Sure, sorry, I was, I was muted. Um, I'm Colin Soper, I'm an Investigations Manager with the Cannabis Control Commission. And so we just want to welcome welcome everybody, um, and thank you so much for attending. We had quite um, a good turnout for this first webinar. Um, this Pesticide Basics 101 webinar has been put together um, in uh, in reaction to the new pesticide policy that came out at the end of 2022, relative to the fact that um, MDAR is now allowing um, some pesticides to be used on marijuana um, if it falls underneath certain um, criteria of which we will go through in the PowerPoint presentation as well. Um, but once you get into that space, there's a lot of different things that folks really need to know and understand about pesticides. And so we wanted to put this very, it's a very basic, but very high level sort of pesticides 101 um, together. So uh, folks can at least start to get an understanding of the world that they might be um, diving into when it comes to using pesticides. Um, we have another webinar scheduled tomorrow relative to worker protection standard, which in and of itself is enough, there's enough requirements in WPS um, for it to warrant its own presentation. Um, uh, one of our inspectors, our pesticide inspectors, Lori Manning will be um, presenting on that. And then uh, from this, I'm expecting there to be a lot of questions, which is great, um, and also um, perhaps some topics and the need for some more webinars um, to happen so that folks can get a, a clear understanding. So this is our first one, so we'll see what, what comes of this, what happens, uh, what kind of questions we have. I also suspect we might end up putting some additional um, guidance documents together if we're sort of seeing a trend on some questions. Uh, or, you know, an area that folks need some additional help with um, or clarification on, uh, we can certainly do that as well. So um, I think that's about all I have to start. Uh, we are going to ask folks to use the Q&A function, which is located on the bottom of your screen to ask questions. I'm going to go through the whole presentation first. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go along in the Q&A function, and at the very end, we're going to start to go through some of those questions and, and answer those questions. Um, we will have our contact information at the end of this as well, so you can always feel free to reach out um, with any additional questions or if we didn't have a chance to get to it. We have two hours scheduled for this. I'm not entirely sure we're going to need the full two hours, but, um, but you never know, so we wanted to give it ample time. And so with that, I'm going to share my PowerPoint, take myself off camera and get into it. So just give me one minute. Okay. All right, Mike, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Okay, perfect. All right. So as I mentioned, this is just a pesticide sort of basics, basic 101 type of class. Um, again, this is going to be pretty general, high level, um, but that does not mean that we can't get into some more of the weeds through questions or if we need to, um, you know, again, having another session if, if that's what we feel would be helpful for folks. 
So first and foremost, the one thing that folks really need to understand um, is the laws that regulate pesticides within the state. Um, it's sort of a, we, we sort of looked at, look at it as a two-tiered approach. Um, so first you need to look at it on the federal level. You've got FIFRA, which is the Federal Insecticide Rodenticide Act. Um, sorry, Federal Insecticide Fungicide Rodenticide Act. Um, and this is um, the law that is uh, regulated by EPA, by the Envir Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and this really provides the baseline structure for regulating pesticides. Um, essentially, a lot of things happen on the federal level before they actually make it down to the state level. Um, but what FIFRA does is it does allow um, the states to individually regulate pesticides on their on their own um, as well. So FIFRA provides the initial structure and then basically says, hey, states, you guys can take, take this, make sure that you don't um, do anything that would essentially violate what we've already written. You can't be less stringent, but you can be more stringent if you like. So it starts with EPA, starts with FIFRA. And then you come down to the state of Massachusetts and the law that the state of Massachusetts works underneath is the Massachusetts Pesticide Control Act um, or MGL 132B. And then from the statute, we have our regulations, which are 33 CMR. And the way that I like to sort of explain sort of how statute versus regulation works is the statute provides the skeleton of pesticides in Massachusetts and the regulations 33 CMR kind of come in and fill in all those blanks um, and sort of make the full package. These can also, all of these can be found online. Um, I would suggest honestly starting with the state law um, versus FIFRA. Uh, we make sure to, to, to some degree that FIFRA is, is also being followed, but FIFRA is a little bit more complicated to sort of go through and, and find. Massachusetts state law and regs are a little bit more, uh, I mean, I think, easier to, to read and understand and to go through. And those are the ones that we can speak directly to. If there's ever a question relative to FIFRA or anything in FIFRA, then certainly always reach out to us. And um, we have folks that we work very closely, closely with at EPA that uh, can help answer any questions that we have. So just some general things and and sort of thoughts relative to pesticides when we're talking about pesticides um, and use specifically. So first you need to understand what, what a pesticide actually is. I think a lot of times folks just think it's something that's gonna kill bugs when in fact it's a little bit more uh, complicated than that. Uh, 132B and FIFRA uh, actually define what a pesticide is. And a pesticide is a substance or mixture of substances that are intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, mitigating the growth of any pest and any substance or mixture of substances intended for use as a plant growth regulator, defoliant, or desiccant, okay? And so what this does is this defines what a pesticide is. And when you look at pesticides, the definition of pesticide is an umbrella. And underneath that umbrella, you have herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, rodenticides, antimicrobials, um, all of sort of the sides, basically, good general rule of thumb is if you're using it to kill something or if it's claiming to kill something, it's a pesticide. Uh, we can get into some more of the nitty gritty um, stuff as far as registration and all of that. But the first general sort of easy rule of thumb is if you're using a product for any of those things that are underneath the definition of a pesticide um, or if that product is making any of those claims, then um, that should be the first red flag that, hey, I'm, I think this is a pesticide. Um, I think I'm using this as a pesticide. And so now we have to follow some rules and some regulations. There are some exceptions to this of which I think some of you all are probably, or yeah, some of you are probably familiar with, which are those 25B minimum risk products. Those products do fall underneath the definition of a pesticide, but they do not get registered in this. They don't get registered. Um, and so we do have some slides here coming up about the registration of products. So folks kind of understand what that process is. Um, so they are regulated, they're just regulated a little bit differently um, because there are some exemptions within FIFRA relative to that. And then um, also we have in there some pet products which then fall underneath FDA, but that's not really a, not really relative to, to this particular, to, to what you all are doing, but um, just to sort of, you know, give you a, a, big, a big picture of things. 
the other thing that we always like to point out is what use of a pesticide actually is, is, um, and the reason that we do that is because I think the automatic assumption is, is that use of a pesticide just applies to the actual application when in, in fact, that is not true. Um, the use of a pesticide includes not only the application of a pesticide, but the mixing, the loading um, of the product, storage and disposal and transportation of a product. So all of those fall underneath the use of a pesticide. And the reason why we like to call this out is because licensing requirements, um, notification requirements, WPS requirements, all of those things come into play when you're talking about the use of a pesticide. And so it's really important to make sure that you are aware that um, it's not just about applying a product. It's a little bit more than that. So we'll talk a little bit about pesticide product registration. Um, this is extremely high level. The process for this is way more detailed. And I should say that when um, a product comes out, um, it takes years uh, and millions of dollars in order for something to be registered. So this is a very, very uh, sort of short and sweet version of what happens when a product gets registered. So say we've got a new product on the market that a manufacturer has developed that they would like to go out into the world and to be used. So say they have Taryn's pest product. Um, it's the next best thing. It's great. It's awesome. The manufacturer would like um, for this product to go out to be sold and to be used. So the first thing that it needs to do is it's got to go to EPA. And EPA is going to require a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it's going to require tox evaluation, risks assessments, research on the product, efficacy information, you name it, they're asking for it. And they're reviewing all of that information. Um, and from that, you know, they might ask for additional information from the manufacturer. They also do their own research on the products as well and look at other scientific studies um, relative to the active ingredient and what it does and how, how it works and risks that might be associated with it. And, um, you know, and when we talk about risks, we're talking about public health, environmental risks, you name it, um, user, um, user health as well. So what risks does the user, um, what risks are posed uh, to the user when they're using this particular product. So all of these different things are looked at. Um, and all of these different things are actually taken into consideration when they are working with the manufacturer relative to the labeling of the product. So a product comes on the market, or a product comes along EPA's desk. They ask for all of this information. They look at all this information. Um, EPA also has to look at this with the lens of, will this comply with other federal laws that are in place? Um, so it's not just in a vacuum. There's other, the Endangered Species Act, um, the Food and Drug Act. So there's a lot of other things that EPA actually has to look at this information and sort of work it against other um, federal laws that are in place. So if this product comes along and they take a look at it, they do all of the things, they decide that they're gonna register it. Another big piece of this is the labeling. And so a, a label on a product um, has to have certain information on there. And if you start looking at multiple different types of pesticides and it doesn't matter if it's like an herbicide or if it's a, um, an antimicrobial or if it's a rodenticide, you're going to notice that they all look pretty similar as far as the, the headings that are on there. So it will have, um, it has to have certain information on there, like environmental hazards, protective equipment, the active ingredients. Um, um, let's see, um, risks associated with it, um, storage and disposal directions, use, but like, so all of that is mandatory language that has to be on the label. What I always like to point out is that what is on that label is relative to the information that EPA has about that product and the risks that it might pose. So for example, if you're looking at a product and it says that you should be wearing gloves, that's because there's a potential, there's a risk for um, dermal concerns if you're using it. Um, if that product gets on your skin, what is it, what's going to happen? So a way to mitigate that risk is to add that type of PPE on there that's going to mitigate the risk to the user. And so labeling is really, really important. Um, there's a reason why we say the label is the law, um, but 
um, the labeling comes directly from the scientific information that has been provided to EPA through the registration process. Um, the other thing that a product will get on the label um, is what we call the EPA registration number. You're gonna hear um, us use that a lot because that is essentially the social security number of the product. You might have um, a product that, or a brand that has multiple versions of it, but they each will have a different EPA registration number. So um, there might be say, Taryn's pest control that is a liquid. And then there's Taryn's pest control that is a wettable powder. And then there's Taryn's pest control that is, you know, like uh, say Taryn's pest control XL. So those are different products and the labels are gonna be different and they have different EPA registration numbers. And the EPA registration number is the most important number on that, on that product. Um, because that links directly to the label, which drinks, which links directly to how that product should be used. Um, also, this is a really good telltale sign um, if you're trying to figure out with whether or not the product that you're using is considered a pesticide. So anything that is uh, a pesticide will have a registration number on it. Um, and it's right there on the label and it says EPA registration number on it or EPA reg number, um, and it gives you that number. You'll also see things on the label like the warning signals, which are indicative of some of the risk associated with that product. And then last, um, EPA will make the determination as to whether or not a product should be general use or restricted use. Um, if a product is deemed general use, that, class, that classification can be changed down the line, which we'll get to in a minute. If it's deemed restricted use, that classification will follow that product to the state and will remain restricted use. Um, and EPA will restrict a product for a number of different reasons. And there, there'll actually be a section on the label that will say restricted use. It'll say this product is restricted use for, and it usually lists out if, you know, what the concerns are with that particular product. So we've got this product, we've got Terrence Pest Control. It's been registered by EPA. EPA has given its, you know, um, it's approved the label. It's got a registration number. It's good to go out into the world. So now the manufacturer has to go to every state that it would like this product to be used. Um, and in Massachusetts, um, it would come through the pesticide program. And um, what happens here in Massachusetts is that a product is registered through an entity called the Pesticide Board Subcommittee. The subcommittee is made up of five individuals of which MDAR sits on one of, um, takes one of the seats and they review the products and then they make the determination as to whether or not it should be registered in the state. They can also put further restrictions on a product. So when I said, when remember when I said, if, it's, if, the, if EPA registers something as general use, it can be restricted further when it gets to the state. Well, this is when that would happen. And it could be for a number of reasons why like Massachusetts would decide to restrict a product. Um, we have some, the, the subcommittee has some standing policies in place. So for example, anything that has more than 20% 24D in it will automatically be state restricted. Um, the latest uh, restriction was relative to neonicotinoids, where if there's a product that has a neonicotinoid in it and it has certain um, sites on the label, it will automatically be state restricted. And so um, the state can then go ahead and, and um, restrict that product further if it if it deems necessary for a number of different reasons. Um, but once that product is then registered by the by the federal government and by the state government, and it's good to go, then it's good to go out into the world and it can be used in Massachusetts. Um, the only stipulation is, is that it does have to renew its registration every year, but for the most part, that's, that's typically not an issue. So the reason why we talk about general use and restricted use is because that does come down to, that leads us to the discussion of licensing. Um, and I know this has been a big question since we came out um, with the updated policy. So relative to our licensing structure, we have several different licensing. I scaled this down um, for this audience, um, but essentially we have two tiers. We have what we call the commercial applicators license, or a lot of people will call it the core license. This license allows you to use general use pesticides. 
It also allows you to use restricted use pesticides if you're working underneath the direct supervision of somebody with the next level up license, which is the certification license. Now, I wanna make sure that we're very clear here. Relative to agriculture, okay? Um, if you are using general use pesticides in an agricultural setting, you do not need this core license, okay? I, I put it up on the screen just because I feel like it, it needs to be talked about, but in agriculture, so if you're working um, at, a, at a facility, in a grow facility in agriculture, and you're using a general use pesticide, you do not need to have a license, okay? The license requirement kicks in when you start to use restricted use pesticides. And that's why this the private certification license is highlighted here, okay? That is the license that you would need for agricultural use of a restricted use product. Um, there are several different categories um, relative to the certification licenses. Um, they're broken down by commodity. Um, so there's things like cranberry, greenhouse, nursery, vegetables, tree fruit, things like that. For marijuana, we would be looking at the greenhouse category um, that folks would want to go for and get. With all of this being said, right now, any of the products that would be allowed to be used, none of them are restricted use, okay? So technically, you wouldn't need to have a pesticide license right now. However, because you are subject to the worker protection standard, which is something that I'll touch on a little bit at the end of this um, session, but again, we have a whole nother session tomorrow. Because you're subject to the worker protection standard, what that means is that you have to train your workers and your handlers. And the only way that you can do that is by taking the train the trainer course or having a private certification license. And so, and I will say this, just generally speaking in agriculture as a whole, most farmers have a license. Um, there's very few farmers that don't have a license, whether they need it or not. Most farmers have a private certification license. And so I think it's just um, good practice to have a license. Um, and it does allow you to, um, it does allow you to train um, for the worker protection standard as well. And we are very early on in this process, um, you know, in two years, three years, five years, 10 years, we have no idea what, you know, the world of pesticides is going to look like, let alone the world of marijuana, you know, on the federal end and this, that, and the other thing. And there may be a point in time where there's a product that, um, is a restricted use product that you can use. And so in that case, you would absolutely have to have the certification license. So to some degree, this kind of, you know, gets you a little bit ahead of the game as well in that you're already um, appropriately certified. So when it comes to licensing, do not go for your core license. Your core license is not needed in agriculture. It is the private certification license that you're gonna need. A little bit about the exam and the licensing process. Um, so there is an exam that you have to take. There are study materials that you can purchase. You actually purchase them online. You purchase the study materials through UMass Extension. Um, everything relative to your license and your exam um, is online. So you do everything online. I would suggest going onto our website. Um, we have a ton of information on there. We also have guidance documents on how to navigate through the ePlace portal, which is where you essentially sign up to take your test. It's where you maintain your license. It's how you obtain your license. It's how you renew. It's all of that. So we have a lot of guidance documents on how to navigate through that system, because to be honest, it's not the most user-friendly. Um, it's not your Amazon sort of one-click sort of thing. So we have a lot of sort of we have a lot of documents out there that show you screen by screen how to get through the system without hopefully getting too hung up. But um, there is an exam that you have to take and it's 125 questions. Specifications to hold on to your license is that you need 12 continuing education units um, within a three year cycle. So every three years you need 12 credits. And after that third year you reset and you need a whole new set of 12 credits. Um, and it's 
the credits need to be specific to the category of which you are certified in. Um, that gives you three years, gives you plenty of time. And um, there are a number of different organizations that offer um, continuing education um, opportunities, whether it's UMass, whether it's um, associations, whether it's the folks that, um, you know, a lot of our larger, the larger vendors that sell material will offer credits, um, usually in the wintertime. Um, but, um, but there are plenty of opportunities to, um, to be able to obtain those credits. And then you have to renew every year. So when you get your license, you'll see that there's an expiration date on it, um, which is December 31st of whatever year you are in. Um, and you need to renew before that. We do communicate through that ePlace portal system. So in October, folks get an email saying, hey, it's renewal time. Um, and at that point, that is when you should be going in and, and starting to renew your license. You have a couple months to renew. So let's get into the nitty gritty and the specifics of what you all can do when it comes to product choice. And again, this is very high level. I did look at some of the questions that folks were submitting when they um, registered for this. Um, so I will first say this, we do not have a running list, okay? What we have done is we have provided guidance documents um, and sort of the specifications as to how to determine whether or not you can use a product. We do not have a running list at this point in time. We do not plan on developing a running list. And that is due to the fact that um, it's, it's a resource thing at this point. Um, one, there's more and more products getting hemp added to the label. EPA has that list right now, which is great. Um, we just, we don't have enough um, resources to continuously keep up keep up to date on updating the list, reviewing the list and, and so on and so forth. So um, we are happy to help if folks get you know in a pinch, but if you're gonna provide us a list of like 25 products for us to review, it's, it's gonna take a while for us to get there. So the expectation is, is that folks go through, um, sort of make sure all the boxes are checked off and then um, know that you're able to use that. And, and again, if there's, Folks are getting hung up on a particular spot and uh, as far as being able to make the determination, let us know. I mean, if we can provide any other sort of guidance documents and information that will help folks move along through this process quicker or make sure that they're pretty, you know, they're solid on the product choice, then, then just let us know and, and we're happy to take a look at that to see what we can do to help. Um, so when we're looking at what products we are allowing to be used on marijuana, first and foremost, product has to be registered by EPA and by the state of Massachusetts, okay? Second, the product has to be labeled for hemp and tobacco, okay? And that has to be actually on the physical label, okay? Um, the active ingredient has to be exempt from a food tolerance, and then it cannot have any days to harvest on the label, requirements on the label, okay? So you decide you need to use something for a pest problem that you have. So what do we do? Step by step. Do you need to follow these steps? No, I, we just, I did this because I thought this would be helpful for folks. If you want to go out of order, that's totally fine. Um, but generally speaking, um, step one, Determine if the product is labeled for hemp. That is first and foremost. I mean, that is the whole reason why we, we decided to change the policy um, is because we started to see products uh, come along that were that had hemp on the label. How do you determine if the product is labeled for hemp? One, review the label. Hemp has to be on the actual label. Two, like I said, EPA right now has a website um, that has all of the products that have hemp, um, that have been labels that have been updated to have hemp on the label on their website. I do not know how much, how long they're gonna keep that list up there, um, but right now it's there, it's a great tool. So go for it and, and use that as a base to start. But then also once you get the product, make sure that hemp is on the label as well. Once you've gotten that box checked, step two, see if it's labeled for tobacco. And that's just a simple um, label review. Okay, we, because folks have asked this, we do not right now, we do not have a list of products that are labeled for tobacco. 
and and by we I mean the state of Massachusetts MDAR. We do not have a list of products that are labeled by labeled for tobacco. We do not have a, a list of products that are labeled for hemp. Okay, um, so you are going to need to determine that by taking a look at the label. Three, determine if the product is registered by EPA. That's simple. One, if you've already if you if you found the product originally from going onto EPA's website, well, then it's registered by EPA. But if not, if you found it in some other way, shape, or form, look at the product label and see if there's an EPA registration number on it. If it's got an EPA registration number on it, it's been registered. Um, it's been registered by EPA. Then you need to check to make sure it's registered with Mass. We have um, on our website, we have a couple of different databases that you can go into. One, I think I think the most effective one and easiest one to use is the Kelly Registrations website, um, which you can get to through our website where you plug in the EPA registration number and it will tell you whether or not it's registered. Step five, determine if the active ingredient is tolerant exempt. We did develop a guidance sheet for this, um, which lists out the active ingredients and whether or not they're exempt from tolerances. Also, the tolerance exempt list is actually found within FIFRA. Um, and so we have links to that on our website too, which is referring to the EPA CFR. And then step six, determine if the product has days to harvest on it. And again, that's, an, that's another label review. If you are able to mark all of those, check all those boxes, you can use that product. However, when it actually comes time to use the product, you need to make sure of these two things. If the product has two different rates for tobacco and hemp, you have to use the lower of the two rates. And if you're using this inside, it has to be labeled for greenhouse. Okay. Mike, did I forget anything? I think that covered it. Okay. Um, some general things, once we get to the point where you have selected a product, it is a product that is allowed to be used. Um, what do you need to do next? Uh, so two of the big things that I pulled up here um, was record keeping requirements. So under 333 CMR section 10, 1014 specifically, we do have record keeping requirements. And so place of application, um, which field location, commodity, room, basically you need to identify where you're making the application, um, date of application, the product's name, the EPA registration number, how much of the product was used, the dilution rate, the target pest, the method of application, and the person's name that made the application and their license number if they're licensed. Those are all what need to be kept in a record for each and every application. On top of that, there are um, requirements that fall underneath the worker protection standard for record keeping that we usually just lump in with the general record keeping requirement, which is the restricted entry interval or the REI, the active ingredient of the product and the time of the application, okay? Um, Lori, tomorrow we'll get into more about what to do with that information when it comes to posting it and making sure folks know about the application. These records need to be kept for, well, the state records need to be kept for three years. The WPS stuff needs to be kept for five. So generally speaking, we say keep these for five. It just makes it easier. Worker protection standard. What is the worker protection standard? Well, for those of you that signed up for tomorrow, you're gonna to learn a whole lot more about this. Um, we do have information on our website. There is actually a ton of information about WPS. There's a lot of different um, train that, like training materials that you're able to get. A lot of this stuff is for free as well um, off of certain websites uh, that I think I'm hoping Lori will be able to touch on tomorrow. Um, but what the worker protection standard is, is it's actually a, a requirement under FIFRA, but then becomes state law because it's it, it's landed on the label. So, um, so you'll see on products that you use that are labeled for agricultural use, this little box that says WPS or worker protection standard requirement. And it's gonna give you some additional information on there. 
Um, and it's really basically information on how to protect your workers from exposure or, or your handlers for that matter for exposure. Um, but in, but that's just like the tight, that's just a small piece um, as far as making sure that you're reading that section on the label. Um, to break it down, WPS covers training whether you're training your workers or you're training your handlers. And a handler is an individual that's using a pesticide, a worker is somebody that's working in the area where a pesticide has been used. Notification, record keeping, respirator fit testing, protective equipment, decontamination, um, application exclusion zones, which are for outdoor treatments. Um, all of that falls underneath the worker protection standard. And those are all things that you need to do um, if you're gonna be using a pesticide. So it's a whole nother sort of set of, of rules and regulations. Did just wanna talk about some pesticide storage stuff. Um, you know, Generally speaking, we wanna make sure now that you're in the world of pesticides that you're storing your material properly. These are just some general, um, general simple things that we would like to see folks do when it comes to a storage area. Uh, one, you want to have it separate, as separate from things as you can. Uh, you want your solids over your liquids. You want secondary containment. So if it's on shelves, really good idea to put them in some sort of, either make sure those shelves have some sort of um, like lip or wall around them, or you put them in like a plastic container. So if something spills a leak or has a rip in it, you don't have pesticides spilling all over the place, all over other things. Uh, we recommend metal shelves over wooden shelves. Again, if there is something to spring uh, a liquid that was to spring a, a leak, wood can absorb that, and then you have an issue versus metal, um, which can be you know wiped down. Um, an inventory sheet of what you have, what's coming in, and what's going out. Um, it's always a really good idea to make sure that you're keeping track of what you've got. Uh, labels and SDSs, uh, labels are on the product. Labels should never be taken off of the product. Uh, the label must stay intact with the product. Um, but we always recommend having an extra set of labels. And nowadays you can go online and print out labels and put them in a binder with the um, safety data sheets. Um, a spill kit. Make sure that you have a spill kit close to your storage in your mixing area, but not with the pesticides because you don't want the spill kit to get accidentally contaminated if there's a spill uh, in your storage area. So have it nearby, have it close. Um, make sure with your spill kit, you know how much it can handle. Spill kits do have a capacity. Uh, you can order spill kits at a lot of different places. You can make your own spill kit. Uh, it's absorbent material, basically. Um, but usually spill kits will come with those absorb pillows um, and a bunch of other stuff. But just know how much your spill kit can handle in the event that there is a spill. Uh, make sure there's good ventilation in your storage area. Um, if you have service containers, those need to be labeled as such, and you need to put what product is in them along with the EPA registration number, the active ingredient, and the label needs to be um, accompanying that at all, at all times. Um, make sure your fire department knows where the storage area is as well. Um, and then we like to have a spill response plan on there. Basically, what happens when there's a spill? What do you do? Um, what are the different steps? What are the three C's? Um, and go over that with folks so that they know. Um, and a spill response plan is good for the storage area, but also for wherever you're mixing and loading the product as well. And I think that was my 25 cent tour of pesticides 101. Um, I, there are some questions in the Q&A function right now. Like I said, this was very, very general, um, very, very high level. Uh, there's a bunch more that we can go into, but I thought this might be a good place to start for folks. So um, with that, Mike, I might need your help a little bit with this, but I'm going to open up the Q&A and start to go through this a little bit. Um, Somebody asked if the slides will be made <clears throat> available online. Um, I we are recording this, so um, so yeah. So once we have these, um, we figure out where we're actually going to post these. Then we will make sure that we let folks know.
Um, let's see. What was it? okay? Can help me with. Uh, our plant accelerator pesticides. Okay, so I think that is a good question. Um, so some of these, the plant, <laughs> the plant questions, the the plant, um, the plant regulators are always a, are always interesting questions as far as whether or not they should be registered as pesticides. Um, the plant growth regulators. So that language actually comes from FIFRA and it actually needs to be determined on the FIFRA level first, on the EPA level first. Um, we, we have had folks sort of send us information. We've had growers send us information be like, hey, we wanna use this product. Can we use this product? Is this considered a pesticide? Um, if that comes up, I would suggest that you still kind of send those over to us and we can take a look and try to navigate it and or we actually go to EPA and ask um, because really it, it starts with them first. Um, and also it's the manufacturer's responsibility to know this as well, I should say. But Mike, I see that you just raised your hand a little bit. So go ahead. If you want to add? Yes. Always remember any pesticide will have that EPA registration number on it. So if you find it on the label. That's a pesticide in the story. Yep. That is your first step and the easiest step to take um, when it comes to, geez, I'm using this. Is this considered a pesticide um, or is this a registered pesticide? Look on the label to see if there's an EPA registration number on there. If there is, you automatically know. If you don't, well, then there's sort of this, then it's like, okay, well, there's no EPA number on it. How are you using it? This is the other thing is, is, is something to take into consideration. But the EPA reg number is first and foremost, the easiest way to determine. How is a plant growth regulator defined? Oof, Mike, that's a good question. Um, that might be in, I mean, I think that's really, that's a FIFRA. That's a FIFRA question really. Um, and again, to, so it, again, the manufacturer that's manufacturing this product and selling this product and advertising this product is the one that's responsible for determining whether or not, um, whether or not the product needs to be registered with the appropriate entities with an EPA is one of them. Um, so certainly, you know, I mean, we've had we've had companies reach out to us and say, "Hey, does this need to be registered?" And we said, "Well, you your company that's making the product, you need to reach out to EPA to make that determination." Um, and so it's you know, it's a plant growth regulator. It's something that regulates the growth of the plant. Whether I think it's it's um, there, but there is a line between a fertilizer which helps assists with right. the nutrients which is a diff which is a whole different thing and again we don't get into to to that end when it comes to the pesticide for what you guys need to worry about if it's a straight fertilizer you're fine um relative to not having to worry about the pesticide rules and regulations um this is a terrible answer to your question by the way um just, but just real quick, Taryn. yeah go ahead it, it, it basically a growth re growth regulator is anything that will um retard or slow down growth and or could, as the previous question said, accelerate growth. And it's really a determination made at the EPA level um, on whether a specific product should be registered as a plant growth regulator and have an EPA registration number, if yep. that helped out at all. Thanks, Mike. That was way more eloquent than what I was just trying to say. <laughs> Um, are cannabis companies allowed to use EPA registered pesticides now? The answer is yes, as long as it fits underneath all of that criteria that we went through earlier. So there is very specific criteria. Um, it needs to be registered with EPA. It needs to be registered in Massachusetts. The active ingredient has to be tolerance exempt. It has to have hemp and tobacco on the label. Um, and there cannot be any days to harvest on the label. Are pesticides the only products that will have an EPA registration number? Yes.
I will say this, and this is a little bit outside of what you guys are going to be using, but like in the, in the lawn care industry, you've got those weed and feeds. So it's a fertilizer and an herbicide mixed in one that will also have an EPA registration number because of that pesticide piece. But yes, only pesticide products will have the EPA registration number. Does Massachusetts adopt other states' private and qualified supervisor licenses, or do I need to retest in mass? You will have to take the Massachusetts test. We do not do reciprocation when it comes to our licenses. Can we use general use pesticides and simultaneously have a private certification license? Yes, absolutely. So I'm just gonna answer this one. So we have to break the law before we know if it's allowable or not. I guess that's up to you if you decide you wanna break the law. We've given very specific criteria for folks to go through. And we've given, I think, some pretty good documents um, to help with this. And we are here and available if you have a question. So, um, if you decide you would like to use a pesticide, then you are responsible for ensuring it. it is the correct product to be used. Um, it's as simple as that. Are these requirements specifically for direct application on the plants? These requirements are for, so, Everything that I just went through today relative to um, licensing requirements, record keeping, um, storage, all of that, that's for any type of application of a pesticide. So if you're using a pesticide, it doesn't matter what you're applying it to. All of 132B, all of 33CMR, and all of FIFRA come into play and you have to follow. Um, the specifications on the product choices is for using, um, is, is if you're going to use a product on the plant. So you can't use anything on marijuana unless the product falls into those very specific criteria. I hope that, that clarifies that. Uh, how do I know if Massachusetts has approved the use of a specific pesticide? Um, if this is in the context of, I want to use this product on marijuana and I'm not sure if I if it's allowable, again, we've set the criteria and the expectation is, is that whoever's using the product on marijuana has made sure that the product clears that criteria. Explain tolerance exempt. Is it yes or no to this? So tolerance, tolerance exempt is something that happens on the FIFRA level, on the EPA level, where they'll look at, they have a list of active ingredients that are essentially are tolerant or food tolerance exempt, meaning that they haven't, meaning that it doesn't, the active ingredient doesn't need to have um, a food tolerance set to it which leads to sort of like a lot of times like your days to harvest. So when you make an application on something, um, a lot of times there's like days to harvest um, to let that product be able to break down essentially. And there's certain levels that are of a pesticide that may or may not be allowed on a particular commodity. And there, but there are active ingredients that EPA has declared don't need any sort of food tolerance associated with it. So hopefully that describes that, that answers that a little bit better because there are allowable levels of certain things on, on, of certain active ingredients on certain things.
But then there's also this list that is like, oh, well, if your product has this active ingredient, it's food tolerance exempt. So we don't need to consider how long before this product can be harvested or so on and so forth. you please explain in more details about the CEUs? Are the credit hours from academic institutions? They can be. So basically how a CEU works, a uh, continuing education unit works, is that um, if somebody would like to offer a credit um, for pesticides, then there's actually a form that we have online that folks fill out and they send it into Trevor Battle, who's um, our program coordinator over there, he takes a look at it. Um, the class has to meet certain criteria in order for it to be um, accepted to be offered, uh, for a pesticide credit to be offered. Um, that criteria is within our regulations. But if that class um, meets that criteria, whether it's a college course, whether it's an association that just wants to have you know, classes and they want to talk about some sort of pest issue that's up and coming and they wanna offer a credit for it, or whatever, um, that application goes to Trevor, Trevor reviews it. If Trevor accepts it, then he lets that individual, the entity know, and he actually sends out the paperwork so that when you do take the class, um, you actually get a piece of paper that is your quote unquote credit. Um, and then um, you hold on to that until it's time to renew your license and then you upload it when you renew your license. So the, the CEUs can come from a number of different places um, and they can cover a number of different topics. But uh, in order to offer those CEUs, it does have to go through um, MDAR first. In regards to the pesticide storage information, are those enforced requirements or things that would like to be seen? Um, those are recommendations. With that being said, we have two very general sets of regulations of which we can apply to a storage area if it's an issue. Um, we have the regulation um, of operating in a careful manner and using a pesticide in a manner that will not cause adverse effects. So if we walk in and a storage area is a disaster and we feel poses a risk or has posed a risk or did pose a risk, um, then we can apply those two regulations to that. Um, but those bulleted sort of storage um, items from the previous slide are, are general recommendations that we think are pretty easy to, to, to adhere to and will at the end of the day create um, or reduce the likelihood of a headache uh, in the event that there's a spill. How can this information apply to organic growing facilities? Um, I guess I'm a little confused on the question. Um, we don't regulate organic just as a, just so folks know, um, something, a product can be marketed as an organic product and it can still be a registered pesticide and it still falls underneath all of the same requirements. Um, but the pesticide program does not dive into like a certified organic or anything like that. If it has an EPA registration number on it, it's considered a pesticide and it falls underneath um, all of our rules and regulations. Are home hormones used in the tissue culture process to culture the cells considered a pesticide? Interesting question. I think that's an EPA question, right, Mike? It, it, it goes back, it, it, it's more or less goes back to the simple, um, simpler answer or simpler 
answer is, does that product hold an EPA registration number? And if so, then yes, it's a pesticide. Um, but there's also times, and this is sort of territory kind of unventured, um, where, you know, if you're using hormones uh, as growth regulators, um, and it hasn't been, in a sense, looked at for that purpose or use, it could be potentially, you know, using something that is for pesticidal purposes. I don't know if we really want to go into that. But um, ultimately, if if it's going to be a growth regulator, you want to make sure that it, it is registered in it or labeled for that use. Can we start using pesticides on cannabis effective immediately? So this policy came out at the end of um, 2022. I think it might have been like December 1st of 2022. The policy came out and it is effective immediately. However, keep in mind, you need to be complying with the WPS, which does take a little bit of work, uh, meaning that you have to do the training, which means that you may or may not need to get your license or at least attend the train the trainer course. Um, so some things do need to come into play first before you can just go ahead and, and start making the applications, but the, the policy is effective right now. What label says what crops a product is applied for? The MS? DS, the EPA, the label on the product. You want to be looking at the label on the product. Um, it will tell you what you, it will tell you what to use it for, how to use it, what to mix it at. That is, so maybe I should have gotten into this a little bit more. So the label is the law. So you'll notice on the label, there's a federal statement that says that it's a violation of federal law to use a label, to use the product inconsistent with its labeling. So that's a federal law, but that's also a state law. So you cannot use that product off label. You cannot go above a mixing rate or a dilution rate or an application rate that is on a label. You cannot use a product, um, you know, in a way that is off label. And so when you're looking for hemp and tobacco and all of these things, you are looking at the label that is on the product. And EPA is the one that essentially approves the label. So that's what you're looking at, the label on the product. The MSDS sheet does not go into all of that detail. The, S, the, the MSD, the material safety data sheets are for, a, a bit of a different purpose. They're not necessarily for the actual end use of that product. Their purposes for the MSDS um, are, are a little bit different, which is why we don't really in the pesticide program get into the MSDS sheet. We, you know, we suggest that folks have it on, you know, have it in the event that there's a spill because there's that information on there. Um, but when it comes to the regulatory structure, it's the pesticide label itself that we look at. All right, Colin, this one might be for you. Um, how would the CCC's and by extension licensed ITLs testing requirements for pesticides be affected by the new guidance from MDAR? I will say this, I mean, we work closely with the CCC obviously, but Colin, I'll, I'll let you go from there. Yeah, I, I, there seems to be no change as far as, as, far as I see um, because certain pesticides are now allowed uh, they do have strict criteria, and those active ingredients are not part of the standard nine that are tested at the ITLs currently. Um, however, the pesticides that you can use, the caveat to this is uh, they have to meet, the label has to meet the criteria of permissible pesticides to be used on cannabis within the state. I hope that answered the question. Uh, if it did. Do 25B products have to fit the same checklist as non-25B products? So right, no. So the 25B products are still allowed to be used as they always have been. Um, it's just if you're using something that has an EPA registration number on it, um, now you're going into this realm of, of, of the criteria. So you can still use the 25Bs as you have been.
are you expecting people to send you a list of pesticides they intend to use or is determination that the pesticide passes the full list of requirements enough to proceed with using the product? Determination that the pesticide passes the full list of requirements and is enough to proceed with using the product. We are not expecting you all to send us a list of products that you intend to use. Um, the expectation is, is that when you wanna use something, you make sure that all of those boxes are checked off and then you can go ahead and use it. Can we use more pesticides other than the 25 Bs if they check all the boxes on those slides? And the answer is yes. Will there be a list available at any point with approved and disapproved products. Not anytime soon. I, I, I never like to say, I don't, I never wanna say never. Um, we will never have a list of disapproved products because that is way more than what would be approved at this point and difficult to keep up with. Um, right now, we will not have a list. I never rule, I don't rule anything out, but right now there will not be a list, but you never know in the future, but right now there won't be. Is mass planning on changing the regulations concerning the use of phytohormones like IBA3? and cytokinins and will pesticides that meet all the requirements be contain these compounds ever be usable? Like, are you familiar with the IBA3? Okay, so um, the, uh, the the IBA is, I believe is an actual ingredient that is on that exempt tolerance list. The issues is, is that they are registered pesticides. Um, if they're not, they should be, but that's an EPA determination per product and the issue right now because I looked at a few for some folks out there is the labeling they're not labeled uh for the specific crops of hemp and gotcha. tobacco and so that kind of keeps them restricted um and that not allowed for use at this point in time um if labeling changes uh we see if it still checks all the boxes and they can move forward with those um, but that isn't anything we can change within our regulation. It's really EPA and the producer of the product working on label changes. Thank you. I, oh, I think we have a clarification to one of the other questions, to the question we were asked earlier. I think it, this is in reference to, do these requirements apply to the application of products to marijuana? So the clarification I think is, which requirements apply if we were only using pesticides as a soil drench? All of these, they'll apply. Is an additional sticker with tobacco and hemp application rates placed on the product by the manufacturer acceptable or does it need to be directly printed on the label? Um, we'd have to double check with EPA, but so it's either, usually the changes are either directly on the label or there's a, what, what's called a supplemental label, but I don't know if that would really apply in this scenario. So I've never seen a sticker. Have you Mike on a label before? Um, no, I have not. Um, so a producer can't just throw a sticker on the label. Um, it has to be supplemental label. Unless they're talking, they're not talking about a sticker adjuvant, I don't think, right? I think they're talking about a physical sticker. Um, right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, on the product, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, all I've ever seen is additional supplemental EPA accepted uh, labeling. Put right. on. Yeah. 
Yep. Well, and I think the other thing here to note is that with tobacco, there is very specific, there are very specific uh, studies that need to be done if you're going to be adding tobacco to a label because of um, the inhalation um, factor. And so there's a whole different set of studies and research that need to be done on a product if tobacco is going to be on the label. So I don't think it would be as easy as just throwing a sticker on the label to add a site because I think there's these additional there's additional um, things that would need to be submitted to EPA first. Um, so yeah, I don't think a sticker is really, a, we've never seen a sticker on a label before. So I'm not sure how legal that would be. From a, FIF, from a FIFRA standpoint as well, I mean, that becomes a federal issue too. Can I use diatomace diatomaceous earth as a pesticide? It is listed under 25B under federal law. Um, so I believe there are some DE products that actually do have EPA registration numbers on them. Um, so you would have to, so in which case they wouldn't be 25B if it's being used as a pesticide. Right, the only thing I wanna add is if, in, that, that I mean, if they're, uh, so I've seen DE products registered, as Taryn has said. I've not noticed DE products in the 25B realm, but that doesn't mean that they're out there, I guess. So it would have to be an actual labeled 25B product. You can't just go buy bulk di diatomaceous earth and use it for pesticidal purposes. And I should say, when you're looking at stuff, um, the inerts in a product also have to be on the 25B list in order for it to be classified as a 25B. So there's active ingredients and then there's inert ingredients and both, all of those need to be um, on the 25B exempt list in FIFRA in order for it to, to qualify not for registration. So I think Mike makes a good point here, though. I think that we just need to flag is you might be able to go buy a bag of diatomaceous earth someplace. Um, but you need to you if you're using it, you can't just buy a bag of DE and use it as a pesticide. So this is the second piece that comes in. Uh, you need to use it according to the label directions. <laughs> and if you're using it for anything other than the label directions, AKA you're using it as a pesticide and it's not labeled as such for that use, then that's an issue and that's a violation. So um, you really want to stick with the products that are labeled for the use that you are, that you're looking for, um, for the intended use. Uh, there are lots of DE products out there that are registered, um, that are, that have, that are meant specifically for pest control for one way or another that's what you should be using, not just a random bag of DE that is, doesn't have, that's labeled for whatever other uses DE can be used for. Um, that would still be considered a violation. Are EPA registered cleaning products also considered pesticides? Yes, those are considered antimicrobials. Um, if you take a look at your, um, Underneath your sink, your products that are underneath your sink, um, a lot of them will have the uh, EPA registration number on them. With that being said, there are a lot of 25B products that are cleaning product, you know, that 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 are cleaning products, but um, like your Lysols, your disinfectants, all of those types of things, um, the the products that are claiming that are making, you know, kills 99% germs, those are registered pesticides. Has there been any movements on IBA-based rooting hormones? Are these still illegal to use on cannabis and mass? Mike, I'm going to kick that one to you. Uh, it's the same answer okay. from the previous IBA one. Um, okay. So they're still not labeled. I haven't found any that have been labeled that have the appropriate labels to meet the um, to meet the criteria. All these. Will the recording be available? Yes, the slides will be available will be available as well. So I just covered this, but we'll reiterate this because this is really, 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 really important, everybody. Um, if a product is not registered with the EPA and 
it is being used as intended, is it allowable for use? And the answer is no. Plain and simple. Same answer for the other IBA stuff. Okay, so the, the question is, can we use IBA salts and propagation? And propagation? What are the rules regarding the use of surfactants? Mike, you want to take that one? Um, ultimately, when surfactants are not raised to pesticides, um, so you want to, re but you need to look at the label for both the surfactant and the registered pesticide to make sure that they're compatible or, or to actually to make sure there's no restrictions. Oftentimes it won't tell you um, not to add the surfactant. Uh, it will not tell you that you can add a surfactant. Often it tells you you cannot, all right? Uh, there's a lot of do nots on labels as opposed to do's. Um, so you just wanna make sure that it is uh, compatible with the product you're using, uh, but it is not a raised to pesticide. That sound good? Yep, thank you. Do you know of any other states that have adopted a similar program which allows hemp labeled plants on recreational cannabis? So there are, um, I mean, as you all know, and I know, you know, some folks here probably work with companies that have other grow facilities in other states. Every state is different. Um, Right out the gate, Massachusetts was very conservative, um, you know, in comparison to some other states. Um, I think states are starting to, to look at the hemp piece of things. Um, and I'm trying to think off, I, I can't, honestly, I can't remember off the top of my head um, which states um, might have some, um, might have some allowances now that hemp is legal and hemp is on the label. Um, but I know that um, if that hasn't been the case that some states are you know, thinking about it or are looking at it. So um, it's really kind of a matter, um, sorry to say this, of, of sort of doing some homework and reaching out to those, those other states. Um, you might be able to find something on the APCO website, which is the Association of Pest, um, um, pest control officials, um, they might have something on there for folks to take a look at. Um, but you know, everybody's different. Some states still don't allow anything. Some states have a big long list, like you know, Oregon and and, and Washington. California has created their own list as well. Some states have specific criteria in order for something to be used um, as well. So um, everybody's just a little bit different. Sorry, that doesn't really necessarily answer your question, but. What is hey, the Taren, link? Hold on one yes. second. Yeah. It, it, he did ask about if there's any federal liability. Oh. I just, just want to mention that we have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the federal yeah. piece is the federal piece. That's a whole nother ball of wax that, you know, we can't really, you know, it's not legal federally. So as you know, that is complicated. What is the link for the MDAR approved pesticides? So um, if you, let me see, I'm gonna just reply if, actually I don't have the link handy. Um, what I will do, if you just Google MDAR pesticide program, it brings you to the pesticide programs made page, scroll all the way to the bottom and there's a section for cannabis. Click on that. That's gonna have the policy which lists out the criteria and we'll have the guidance documents which have the links to certain, um, to, the, to all of the things that we've talked about today. And if you can't find something, then just shoot us an email and we'll get, we'll get you, we'll point you in the right direction. Are these policies enforced by EPA or MDAR? That would be MDAR. This is a state policy. This is the state where we're looking at state law and state policy here. So it's MDAR folks that go out.
There are a lot of cannabis products out there that avoid certain words on their labeling in order to avoid being categorized as a pesticide, and that's to avoid being subject to regulations. What are your thoughts on products like these? I mean, that goes down to the intended use. Um, and I will say, I mean, honestly, the cannabis industry is not, you're not the only industry that's ever, that this has ever happened in. Um, Mike and I have been with the department for a lot of years and we've seen a lot of different things. Uh, and eventually um, it comes to light um, as far as when, when folks are trying to get around the requirements and the regulations and the safety aspect of things, um, it usually does come to fruition. And if there's ever a question about anything, again, you know, I know folks don't usually like to reach out to the enforcement folks, but we are here to help and we are here to make sure that um, folks are able to use products and they're able to use them in a safe manner um, and pose the least amount of risk, which is why labeling is so key. So this is the other thing that I, I, we always like to talk about when we talk about pesticides and labels and safety. We never say that a pest, like a pesticide has a job to do and it's to kill a pest. And so that label is written in a manner such so that if you use that product according to label directions, you are posing the least amount of risk to yourself, to the environment, and to public health. Um, if you are using something off label or for a different purpose than what it's intended for, you are, you know, putting out an undue risk. You're, you, it's a risk. It's a big risk. It's a health risk. It's an environmental, it's an environment risk. And so that's one reason why the label is the law, because if you use that product according to label directions in the manner that it was intended, it will pose the least amount of risk. Um, and so when you're taking products that have a label on it and they're being kind of gray with the label so that it doesn't have to be registered, but it's being used in another manner that's in, like to kill a pest, you, there's a big risk in that. There's a real big risk in that. There's a risk in that for the manufacturer and there's a risk in that for the person that's using it and knows that. Um, there's a real big risk in that. If a product says can be used on day's day of harvest, can it be used? Or does that count as days to harvest? Um, I would say you can use it. Usually it'll say three days to harvest or days to harvest three or days to harvest five. If you can use it the day of harvest, then you can use it. So if a plant regulator has an EPA number, it's definitely a pesticide, just making sure. You are absolutely correct. <laughs> if it has an EPA registration number, it is a pesticide. It is considered a pesticide. I keep like looking at the number of questions and I keep hoping they're, go they're going down, but they keep staying at about 50. <laughs> I'm trying to get through these as quickly as possible here. Um, Oh, okay, this is a good one. If we're using a product that could be considered a pesticide, but not using it on plants as a pesticide, like for example, using surf sulfur as a fertilizer, does it still need to be registered as a pesticide within our facility? So one, you as, you as the grower, you're not registering any pesticides. That's not happening. It's it's the whoever's making the product is the person that's registering the product, registering the um registering the the, the product as a pesticide. Two. If the sulfur product that you're using is labeled as a fertilizer and has instructions on how to use it as a fertilizer, then you're using it as a fertilizer, end of story. And there's no, even if sulfur is in an active ingredient in some other product like Terran's pest products, well, it's that product that's Terran's pest product that's a pesticide. But if you're using Terran's sulfur fertilizer and you're using it as a fertilizer, as its intended use, then you're fine.
Are there any regulations for predatory mites? Not by us. Nope. Those are considered beneficial insects and we do not register those. Can we use Clonex rooting gel? Not yet, right? Nope, cannot use that. Are there any specific label requirements to a 25B product that will restrict use in cannabis? Um, no, um, so the 25B products, I'll give you a little bit of background on the 25B products. So the way that the 25B products work, they're called minimum risk pesticides. They actually are pesticides, but they're not registered. And because they're not registered, there's sort of all of these things that it's just a different path that these products take. So in FIFRA, there's a list of active ingredients and a list of inert ingredients. And if a product comes into play that all of its ingredients, you know, fall underneath both of those lists. They're considered a, a 25B minimum risk pesticide and they're exempt from registration. With that being said, uh, and because they're exempt from registration, they don't have to go through a lot of the stuff that a typical quote unquote typical product would have to go through. Um, but because of that, there are restrictions on how these products can be labeled. So like these products can't make any health claims. Um, there has to be certain claims on the label. Um, I mean, it's, the, the requirements are minimum, but you'll notice a 25B product may or may not look like a registered product label. And that's because their labeling requirements are totally different. What we're finding is more and more of the manufacturers that make your traditional pesticides are also making 25B products. And so in that case, you'll see the label following, you know, similar criteria, but you'll, you know, you might have like Mike's home, you know, Mike's home remedy company, company, I say home, right. You know, that, that, that's got two products that he's dabbling into and, and, and he's, you know, trying to get out there in the world and sell and he qualifies as a 25B and his label might look totally different. Um, and so there isn't any specific label requirements on a 25 that would restrict its use on cannabis, but um, you know, obviously read the label, follow the label directions, um, and just know that they are handled differently um, than your other, than your products that are registered. Piggybacking on the ox, if we on the oxen question, if we find a rooting hormone that is EPA registered and hits all the other pesticide requirements, can we use it in mass? Yeah, yeah. If you can check all of those boxes on that product and it's registered with EPA, because then yeah, go for it. Uh, I think this is a question for you, Colin. How will the new regulation on bacteria products affect cannabis microbial testing on flour? <clears throat> Sorry, I, I would need that person to elaborate a little further as to what regulation they're speaking of. Um, I don't know of a new regulation in regard to uh, bacteria on flour. Um, are they speaking of irradiation? I don't, it would, I, I need that person to elaborate a little more on that question to, to give a definitive answer. Okay. Uh, when you say service containers, does this mean all large drums inside a cultivation facility are required to have the same labeling as a small container? Okay. So typically when you're buying products, it's very rare that we see like 50 gallon drums, 30 gallon drums of a pesticide. It's, it's rare that we see that. Um, but whatever you're purchasing your product in, in whatever container your product comes to you in, there is a label on that product, okay? What sometimes folks like to do is they, you know, they, they like to put it in a, um, in a smaller container because it's easier to mix. And so we call that the service container. 
So say you do have a 30 gallon container of something and you wanna put it into a five gallon container because it's easier to pour into whatever your method of application is and mix that way. That five gallon container would have to have the active ingredient, the EPA registration number on it, um, the product name, and then there needs to be a copy of the label um, accompanying that five gallon container at all times. Um, that's what we mean by service container. And then the original label on the 30 gallon container should be staying on the 30 gallon container. Is there a way for us to verify through MDAR that a specific pesticide is appropriate and approved to be used with cannabis? So <clears throat> again, we, you know, we don't have a list um, where setting the criteria for folks to use. If folks have a question on something, please, you know, we, we are here to help um, in whatever way we can. But again, if you're gonna send us a list of 20, it's gonna take us a long time to get back to you on that. But if you've got questions, if you find something and you're not quite sure, just send us, just, it's fine to reach out to us and ask. Um, just know that there may be a little bit of a delay. I am gonna, whether it's one, there'll be a very big delay if there's 20, but if there's one, um, you know, we're, we're happy to help and, and sort of navigate through this. We, we want folks to be able to, you know, use this stuff appropriately and legally. Um, so we are here to help as much as, as, much as we can, um, but we do not have a list right now. Oh, this is an excellent question. Um, what if a product meets all the criteria? It's registered for hemp via the EPA registration list. The online label has both hemp and tobacco listed, but it is not on the physical bottle label as if that product could have possibly came from an older stockpile before the physical label changed. You have to follow the label that is on the product you are using. Okay, um, so it's a matter of buying another product, <laughs> buying a newer product that, that has that on the label. Um, label changes happen. Um, and the, the, the rule of thumb is you use the label according to the label directions that are on that label that are, on, that are attached to that product that you are using it from um, at that point in time. And honestly, um, do you really want to use something that's from an older stockpile? I don't know how effective it's going to be. Um, so that's just something to consider as well, uh, just as a side note. But it's got to be on the label that is on the product. Can a product that is not EPA registered, but has the same active ingredient of an EPA registered product be used as a rooting nutrient. I feel like it's a it's a product that should be registered if that's the case. If it's if it's the same, if it's a different product but has the same intent as one that is registered, then it should be it should be registered. But if you're using it as a rooting nutrient, you're using its intended use as being used as a pesticide as well. Mike, is that right? Um, yeah, so uh, ultimately you gotta follow the label. So if you find a product with the same thing and it's just for rooting nutrient, then I guess, you know, you might fall in a loophole. Uh, uh, for the time being, I don't know, but it, it's really considered a pesticide if, in fact, we're able to determine that it's pretty much the same thing as uh, another exact, probably duplicate of the product. And EPA hasn't caught up yet. And so that would be something we'd probably forward to the EPA for further guidance. I, I, I stay clear from it. I think... Mike, you just made a good point with that last little advice. Um, there are things that are not always black and white in this arena right now and still. And as much as we can, 
um, we're going to suggest uh, in order to make sure that you're covered because the ramifications of a violation are pretty hefty. Um, you stick with stick with stick with stick with the black and white as much as you can um and, and getting into these gray areas and we're you know we're here to help navigate through that for sure um but you know there are some gray areas still and 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 all of that and we want to make sure that folks are staying on the right side here so that there you know there aren't any violations that could you know at some point down the line severely impact impact you all is there a database where we can access all regulatory literature for cannabis for free, CMR, NFDA, et cetera? So um, our website, so our statute and our CMRs are all on our website. So 132B and, C and 33 CMR on our, are on the Department of Ag's website. You can access those. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned before, we have the policy and the guidance documents on the pesticide programs um, web page. Hey, both the Cannabis Control Commission, just throwing that out there. Um, our regulations can be found on the website along with guidance documents um, <clears throat> for reference uh, on the page itself. Are there restrictions on cleaning and disinfecting chemicals to be used on tools, equipment, surface, et cetera, even if they have an EPA registration number? Well, if you're using the cleaning and disinfectant chemicals on tools and equipment and surfaces, according to the label directions, you're fine. You can use those. It's when you're using it on the plant, the plant material and through the growing process. Mike? Just one little, one little caveat. Yep. Some of those products that you use for cleaning can, uh, I'm, I'm specifically talking maybe like Xerotol and such, may have agricultural use requirement on the label. Um, so you might be falling under WPS depending on how you use it. Um, but there are a lot of cleaning products on those tools and stuff that do not have the agricultural use label, but still allowed for use on tools and such. So you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about WPS at that point in time. Not to confuse the matter any more than it already is for all you folks. Sorry. <laughs> Sanitate's another good example of that, yeah. Do SDS sheets need to be kept with products or is a separate log acceptable? Um, I think a separate log is acceptable, um, you know, a lot of times what we'll see is we'll have record keeping in one sort of book, and then we'll have the labels and the SSDS sheets, like a separate label book from labels that you've printed off online um, or made copies of, um, and the SSD, SDS sheets in another book. Um, that's, that's totally fine, however you want to keep them. We just suggest that you make sure that they are available um, for anybody that would like to see them. To clarify, do we have record keeping requirements for using cleaning chemicals for hard surfaces cleaning such as bathrooms? No, you do not need to keep record keeping um, for when you clean your bathroom or your you know, break room or your lunch room, that's fine. It's when you're using the cleaning um, chemicals like during the agricultural sort of for, for the agricultural purposes. Okay. <laughs> um, let me try to go. I, I think we kind of already addressed this when it comes to something that is not registered as a pesticide, but has an active ingredient that is in pesticides and whether or not we can, you can use it and how to use it. And again, 
it comes down to the labeling of the product, whether or not it falls underneath the definition of a pesticide and EPA determines it has to be registered. And then what you're intending, what your intended use is. The, 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 the cloning stuff and the plant growth regulators are tricky, guys. Um, those are the tricky ones, which if they're, and I would just say this, if you have a question about a particular product, just reach out to us. Does MDAR offer the train the trainer courses for WPS trainings? Um, we do here and there. They're not, we don't have them all the time. Um, there is a training that you can take online though, um, which I'm assuming Lori will go over tomorrow. Um, so if you don't get it from us or from UMass Extension or from um, you know somebody else that is authorized to offer a train the trainer course, um, you can go online and, and take a train the trainer course or you can get certified. How many credits do you typically get with a course? Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about the continuing education credits. Uh, so one credit is 50 minutes. So typically it's an hour. Um, in some cases you might have an entity offer a two hour class. Uh, so for example, UMass Extension usually has me come in and do a two hour laws and regs course. Um, but typically it's, a, it's about, an, usually folks offer like hour courses. Why did the opinion change in this state concerning use of pesticides on cannabis? It used to be prohibited completely. What is the reason for the change? So we reevaluated the policy once hemp became legal federally. Um, so in 2018, Farm bill was passed, hemp became legal. What we started to see about a year, a couple years after that was that uh, pesticide labels were starting to come out and have hemp on them. Um, and we recognize that hemp and marijuana are the same, they're cannabis, and their only difference is um, a legal definition of the THC levels. And so we took a look at that um, and we took that into consideration. We, you know, acknowledge the fact that growers, you know, were having pest pressures, um, but we also did recognize, you know, just some of general concerns that were still there because while hemp and, and marijuana are the same plant, there are, you know, and the, the uses are the same, there were still some things that, you know, we we wanted to make sure were covered um, from a safety standpoint, which is why we, we set up the, the criteria the way that we did. How about natural products? For example, neem oil or neem meal as a pesticide. They may not be listed as a pesticide, but will be used as a pesticide. Neem, neem oil actually is a, I believe, a, I think there are actually registered products with neem oil in them. Um, again, if you're using it as a pesticide, then you should be using, and we know that there's neem oil out there that's actually registered for that use, you should be using the registered products. Colin, I think this is maybe one for you. Have the testing labs been updated of the new policy and changed their pesticide requirements for passing product? You may have already answered this in the previous question. Yeah, I, the ITLs, <clears throat> uh, I'm sure are aware of this, uh, but the testing requirements have not changed. Uh, just the list of pesticides that are allowable now. Uh, the, the same active ingredients are still, uh, you know, prohibited or permissible, depending on what they are, but they still test for the standard nine pesticides, uh, same as they've done prior to the changes in pesticide usage. Is isopropyl alcohol considered a pesticide? A product we use is made up of ingredients from the 25B list aside from the alcohol. Would we be able to use that product? Thank you. If the no, no. So in order for something to be considered a 25, to a product to be considered a minimum risk pesticide product, 25B, the entire product, everything in that product has to be on that 25B list. 
So isopropyl alcohol would have to be on that 25B list, whether it's the active ingredient list or the inert ingredient list. Sometimes it's the inert ingredients that, that push it from a 25B into the sort of regular registration process because you have to, all of the products in that product have to be listed under FIFRA and the 25B exempt list. And you all can, I mean, that list is online if anybody is ever curious. Um, EPA actually has a pretty good website that talks about the 25Bs and, and has the lists and explains what they are. Who handles enforcement of the pesticide regulations, the CCC or MDAR? Uh, the CCC and MDAR work very closely together when it comes to this. Um, 132B and 33CMR um, are MDAR regs, but um, the CCC also has language, I believe, Colin, correct me if I'm wrong, and together we work on these things um, jointly. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we we uh, hold similar yet separate investigations that run parallel with each other. Our, our regulations reference uh, Massachusetts General Law 132B and MDAR itself. Is there a certificate provided to folks who take the WPS training? Um, so there is not, but there are, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, because it's been a while since I've been in the field. There's cards that you can, no, nope, they don't have the cards anymore. Yeah, I, I don't think you can, I don't think Laurie can get the cards anymore. Um, okay. It's really what has to happen is um, record, records are required of the training being kept by the trainer. Um, and if they choose to give a certificate out, that's fine. Uh, what we've found in the past is that when you have um, workers uh, sort of going from one employer to another, that employer doesn't want to accept that WPS training, uh, doesn't want to accept that liability, so redoes the training all over again. And I think that's an actual requirement nowadays anyway, but I, I can't be certain off the top of my head. So there isn't any card um, that they run around with anymore, at least none that I that I don't think she can get a hold of, hand of it anymore. Okay, thanks. So record keeping and also um, when we do do the worker protection standard inspections, because there are inspections that enforcement staff does relative to WPS, um, we do interview workers to make sure that they actually have been, they have gone through the training. Through some brief product vetting, there are some products that meet all requirements, but do not mention outdoor nor specific indoor specific application instructions. What would MDAR suggest in that scenario for suitability? Um, I would suggest that if you have a product that you would like to use that falls under this criteria and you're not sure, just send us send it to us and we'll take a look at the label. With the WPS regulations, what if you had previously held your applicator's license for greenhouse and then went through the UMass training courses, but your license is expired? Um, would that still be considered enough experience to train or be compliant via the train the trainer? Uh, the answer is no, sorry. You have to hold the certification or have gone through the train the trainer course. You actually have to hold the certification if you're giving the training or have gone through the train the trainer course. I think you have to go through the train the trainer course so many years. Um, I don't think it's every year, but I think it's so many years you actually have to like re up on that training. Can I still use a 25B product if it is not specifically labeled for hemp and tobacco? Yes. Are rooting hormones looped into the plant growth regulators? A bit confused if that was already answered or not. Mike? <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, um, yeah, in a sense, rooting hormones, PGRs are generally the same thing, um, and it is confusing. Um, you just got to read your labels. I know there's some um, sort of solutions out there that aren't uh, labeled or considered PGRs or growth hormones that are allowed to be used, but a lot of the rooting hormones slash compounds are raised to pesticides. So just, just, just be careful, you know, read your labels and when in doubt, give us a ring. Okay, I do just want to go back and clarify something relative to the regs and the laws. Um, so we work very closely with the CCC, as Colin said, we run, you know, investigations together. Um, the CCC has their rules and regs, we have our rules and regs. We enforce, we have the jurisdiction to enforce 132B and 33 CMR. So that's that's where we are, but we run our investigations um, again together and the CCC has their rules and regs that, that they have the authority to enforce. Just wanna make sure that we make that clear. Can I use diatomaceous earth? It is listed as a 25B under federal law, but has an EPA number. Um, if you're using diatomaceous earth for pest control, you need to be using the one that has the EPA registration number, and then you need to be making sure that it checks all of the boxes that we have listed earlier. Clarification on supplemental labeling. Um, so supplemental, I mean, supplemental labeling is essentially what happens when a manufacturer has registered a product and they're making some label changes. And um, there's a number of different things that would trigger a manufacturer to start to have a supplemental label. Um, and it's kind of going down a rabbit hole to kind of get into some of those different specifications. But essentially it's when you would get a product that has the label on the product and then whoever's selling you the product hands you another sort of piece of paper almost, or another package that has more labeling instructions on it that might be more specific to a state um, or to a type of pest or to, you know, like, for example, if, um, if a manufacturer wanted to add a pest to their label under a certain section of FIFRA called 2EE, instead of having to um, you know, reprint a whole bunch of labels, they might just have a supplemental a label attached with the original product and the original label for a time being. Um, it's, it's still considered labeling and you still have to follow that. We consider it a label, but essentially it's, there's a number of different things that could trigger a manufacturer to do that, but it's essentially additional information that comes with the product that may not nece necessarily be right on the product but gives you use instructions and things like that. Hopefully that's clear. Is WPS training satisfied when a worker handler watches the WPS webinar video that will be presented and recorded tomorrow? No. Um, the WPS webinar for tomorrow is to inform you all on what the requirements of WPS it are. Um, so worker protection includes training, notification, fit testing, making sure the right PPE is provided, all of the different things. That's what tomorrow is about. Tomorrow's kind of like a WPS 101. Um, the worker and handler training is totally different. Um, so that is what you're going to need to um, show your folks in order to be compliant. Are predatory insects allowable as part of IPM practices? Um, we would say that yes, beneficial insects is an IPM tool that is used. So integrated pest management, yep. Predatory insects are a tool. IPM is all about using a number of different tools in your toolbox when you're looking at a pest problem. So yes, we would consider that.
why when there is proof on IBA3 that it is harmless and even used in other food crops, mass continues to restrict it. So we're not necessarily restricting it. It just, we've set the criteria as a whole for is this is this is the criteria. And so it doesn't fit into that criteria right now. And so it's not that we are quote unquote restricting it. It's just, it doesn't fit into the criteria that we've set forth for any type of pesticide that is gonna be used on marijuana. Um, you know, they're, they're, the reason why we had, you know, so hemp was what sort of started the ball rolling. We added tobacco into this. We want tobacco to be on the label because we are, we realize and we understand that, um, uh, you know, marijuana is smoked and we want to make sure that we're covering that base and any issues with inhalation. Um, you know, there's all of these different things that have come into play for the decisions that we've made, um, of which, you know, if you guys take a look at the policy, we tried to kind of give a little bit of an explanation as far as how we got to where we are and in, in, in sort of the decisions that we made in our policy. Um, but IBA3, it's it just, it's, it's, it's not just a mass thing, you know, it's, it's a whole big world of uh, decision making and requirements and rules and regulations that come into play. I have a 25B product with the exact wording suitable for use on all crops, including cannabis and hemp. Is this product acceptable to use? If it is a 25B product, then yes. if it's a 25B product. When coming up with the requirements, were there actual products available that were known to meet the requirements for use? Um, yes, we did take a look at some labels um, and knew that that was the option, that there was stuff. We also knew that this was a growing that the that this was that the list of products that folks were going to be able to use would be growing because you're going to find more and more products that have hemp on the label. Um, so, you know, we knew that even if it started off with a small population of products over time, the number of products that folks are going to be able to use would likely be growing. And I think when they, when EPA first came out with their list online, I think it was just a list of maybe 40. And I think they're up to like 90 now. And I know that's only one piece of the criteria, but just to sort of, you know, give you an example. This is a good question. How do you determine if a product is general use or restricted use? Excellent question. Um, if it's general use, uh, um, Actually, let me let me let me go back. Uh, if it's restricted use, if it's federally restricted, you're going to see something that on the label that says this is a restricted use product. If it is state restricted, you are not going to see that um, because that just gets done uh, on paper. However, you should not be able to purchase a restricted use product, whether it's federally or state restricted, unless you have the proper licensure. So anybody that sells a restricted use product actually has to be licensed with the department and they are not allowed to sell a restricted use product to somebody unless they have the proper license. Um, so that is another way that you're gonna be able to know is that if you don't have a license, you won't be able to get hold of it. Also, if you use that Kelly registrations link, um, it will tell you whether or not it's general use or restricted use. And I think we're gonna take one more question because I think we're just about out of time here. Um, let me see if I can find one. Um, let's see. Oh, well, I think this is a good one and appropriate for tomorrow. <laughs> for taking the WPS training, do we sign up through MDAR? How do we sign up our staff for taking the official training? 
hopefully you're going to go to the webinar tomorrow. Uh, Lori will go through all that uh, to sign up for the training. There's actually like a video that and out like that we can send links to that essentially folks will just sit their their workers and handlers down and show them the video. Um, but Lori will go through all of that tomorrow. You can still register for the webinar tomorrow if folks are interested in it. Um, the link should be in the original um, announcement that was sent out uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, if you don't have it, then feel free to shoot me an email and I will get you the link. Um, but other than that, so, I mean, there's still a ton of questions here in the Q&A. Um, so I really appreciate folks um, taking the time and uh, coming to this. I think that this would certainly we had enough participation and enough questions that um, I think we will try to make arrangements to, to set up another one of these. Um, I will go through all the Q&A questions as well, again, to see if maybe there's a general theme that we might be able to uh, develop some guidance documents or add to our FAQ um, document um, to clarify some of these things. Um, but I do appreciate everybody attending. Um, if you have any questions whatsoever, uh, do not hesitate to reach out to Mike or myself. Just, you know, bear with us because I assume that we might get an influx of emails after this. <laughs> so it might just take us a little bit to get back to you, but we are here to help folks through with this. Um, and we really appreciate everybody's participation. So thank you so much, everybody, and have a great day.